Great. Try and, uh, hit some points that I imagine people might like to speak to. Um, yeah, I'll just begin that. So, um, in the beginning of the chapter, Steiner's talking about how this the philosophical development and the sort of immersion of the ego in in thought, you know, has served to facilitate the the experience of the ego. So self conscious, the self conscious ego, um, and and that this has also introduced um, through this sort of immersion in subjective experience uh, an element that that uh, creates a kind of illusory picture of the world. So he says, like, our organization introduces something that, uh, you know, basically keeps us from being able, able to perceive the world um, in its truth, which may be in contrast to the way that thought was experienced by the Greeks in perception. And so I, I you know, I'm aware, you know, uh, from other lectures and different texts that Steiner talks about, um, so I just have this in mind in consideration of this development where he talks about, I guess, during what he calls the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, there was a sort of, the, the etheric body and the physical body became most deeply united and now there's been a progressive loosening again. So that's just something I kept in mind as I was reading this chapter because I can kind of see it coming through, especially in his uh yeah emphasis on this this element that we're introducing through our mental organization that creates a kind of illusory picture of the world as being complete in itself and so in this chapter he's also talking about one of the challenges is to not um i guess attempt and in our uh approach to knowing the world the sort of materialistic approach of assuming that the sense world is complete in itself and that we are to imitate it in order to know it is just going to continue to lead to an impasse. And uh, yeah, so this 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 cognitive or this the the I guess he describes that we extinguish something from the world um, before we bring thoughtful observation that kind of you know cognitive activity that he describes um, where he describes knowing in this sense like in the kind of Gertian sense as a real process of reunifying with the world. And and yeah, so he said he basically describes how the any attempt uh, to, I guess, approach the world and circumscribe it purely in a sort of materialist terms only serves to reinforce the self conscious ego. Um, though perhaps there is, you know, some value to the materialistic um, lens, as long as it's not treated as, you know, absolute. And so he says we have to go beyond, you know, what we experience in ordinary consciousness. That's what the sort of philosophical development is challenging us to do. Um, and so it's a necessity to go beyond that. And, you know, the approach that he describes, uh, in, you know, includes these exercises that he suggests um, out of spiritual science um, where through his example is the concentration on thoughts that aren't you know taken from the sense perceptible world uh, which gradually through the concentration he describes it as a condensing of that experience and, uh, and so he says this is possible also for feeling at uh, willing and sensing, I believe. And, and so that is what potentially uh, affords experiences that go beyond everyday consciousness. And then he talks about how um, this reveals um, the ego, that the ego has its being uh, outside of the body in the general order of things, which I think would be interesting to talk more about if anybody has insight into that. I mean, I thought of Hegel uh, in that respect, um, but just what is, especially when we're thinking about ego and individuality and yeah, anyway, I'm curious to hear what y'all think about that. He talks about the body as a kind of mirror, and especially if we think about, you know, this period of 
materialism um, and the body as a mirror sort of reflecting the ego, you know, and, and intensifying that experience of the self into self consciousness through this materialistic phase. That's kind of how I understand uh, what he's saying there. Yes, and then he also describes that the, these super sensible experiences are comparable to our experience of memory. So maybe somebody has some insight into that. I've heard him say similar things, or at least heard Dale say similar things from different lectures about that. Um, yes, and that breaking into these super sensible experiences is for Steiner the way um, to, I guess, continue unfolding the philosophical riddles. Uh, and that science has sort of prepared this, this sort of the rigor of science trained on the physical world, the sense perceptible world has uh, created this, I guess, this practice that uh, allows for a kind of accurate, I guess, um, exploration of the super sensible, or at least to to have this um, mm, Barfield in one of his essays talks about it this way, where like what's being sort of taken over from the materialist science is this aspiration for accuracy, even though it's not trained on the same world. And then the last two things I wanted to touch on um, were when he mentions uh, how spiritual science will disclose a higher human nature for whom the physical body or man or human is like a tool. And then um, further, this great quote where he is again comparing the human to sort of a plant in that um, hold on just a sec. On the other hand, the spirit soul entity appears in the body like the sum total of the forces in the plant, which after it has grown into a leaf and blossom, contract into the seed in order to prepare a new plant. One cannot experience the inner spiritual man or human being without knowing that he contains something that will develop into a new physical man. So there's this experience, well, through this experience, there's this intuition of, for, you know, uh, subsequent lives, so rebirth, rebirth reincarnation. And then finally, um, yeah, just toward the end, end of the chapter, describing how uh, I thought it was interesting that um, this last paragraph that he ends with, he says that, you know, what he's sort of introducing here with spiritual science has been perhaps articulated along the byways of the philosophical development, but as he, as you know, according to Steiner, you know, from his perspective, there's been this necessity for the philosophical development, you know, uh, sort of blossoming in Greece to kind of think its way through everything. And I just thought that that, you know, could be thought of as almost like a kind of purification or something, um, a process of purification for the emergence of, you know, what he's calling spiritual science. So anyway, that's my little summary. Hopefully it was helpful. Who wants to jump in? May I just offer? Go ahead, Jonathan. Um, there's something that I thought was inaccurate. That, that was wonderful, Ashton. Thank you very, very much. But the point about the mirror, um, as I understand it, is not that um, you said that it kind of mirrors and focuses the ego and kind of uh, magnifies the ego in a secondary sense yes but it's primarily um uh activity is that the the body mirrors the the spiritual world and and, and sort of it, as it mirrors it back and we see it sort of as in a mirror and take it as a physical as a, as a purely physical world because of that, yes, um, then we feel separate from it, and then we, we obtain a sort of greater realization. We're not quite that, and, and so we have a greater realization of our ego. Yeah, I, I, uh, I would agree. I mean, I guess the way that I described it did make it seem like I was saying that, um, which he doesn't, you know, he's not emphasizing here. It was more just my additional speculation that 
um, that the physical you're not wrong enable that yeah 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 well I just wanted to sort of clarify that bit yeah that's helpful thank you <clears throat> thanks Jonathan so I'll get in line here it looks like uh, Jeff your your hand went up first and then Angus and then I'll share some things go ahead Jeff It took me a second to find the mute button there. Um, yeah, I have, um, uh, Ashton, by the way, thanks for your summary. I'm actually going to speak to one of your thoughts in a moment. Um, I have two general points of feedback on this chapter. And I mean, the book as a whole has been like one powerhouse chapter after another, but this one really uh, took the prize. Um, so two points of that I have. One is uh, I'm going to borrow a phrase from Reich, which he uh, which he put forward as the idea of the silent observer. I'll explain that in a second. And my second point of feedback is going to be reaching into Hahnemann. Oh, excuse me for the background noise. On uh, uh, a German term that he used, which is so central not only to his system of medicine, but I think. To, uh, to all of you know, romantic science and spiritual science. And the, the German term is Erzeugungskraft, which means generative power. And I'll, I'll come back in a, a minute and explain that as well. But my, my first point of reflection, as I said, on the, what I'm calling the silent observer, what Reich called the silent observer, I think I've, I've seen Steiner do this before in other books or lectures, but he does this, especially in this chapter, he refers to himself in the third person. Now that may just seem trivial or whatever, just a, a weird way of writing. But I think there's something, as I'm saying, coming from Reich in this concept of the silent observer. And actually, Ashton, what were you saying about the, um, the? oh, it'll come to me in a minute, but there's something you were saying that I wanted to link this to about, um, oh yeah, the, just this whole idea of the, the body-free uh, state of consciousness. I, I believe that's exactly, first of all, what Steiner is putting forward in this chapter as this special state of consciousness, right? Uh, what I keep calling uh, the silent observer by Rick. And right, I should have explained what, what in the, his last books, his final books, Reich started to refer to himself um, kind of in this third person way. And he kind of gave himself the name, the silent observer. In fact, he, he would inscribe his author's preface to his book you know, his final book or whatever, you know, you know how it's written, uh, you know, written in such and such a city and, and date, and then usually the, the author's name or initials, but he would just uh, give his name as Silent Observer or SO. So anyways, I think this is precisely what um, Steiner's putting forward in this chapter as this special state of consciousness, consciousness we need to do spiritual science, right? Really the, the foundation. And um, so yeah, this whole idea of this body-free state of consciousness, you know, independent of our physical organs. And that's, uh, to me, that's a kind of a, uh, I've thought about this for a long time. What, what does the, the word silent observer mean? And to put it into Steiner's context here, it's, it's like this, when you don't have all the noise, right, of all the, the physical organs, you know, the eyes that we're usually dependent on for sight and all these kinds of things. It's like we have all these radio stations of all our organs normally feeding this, this information to us, this noise, so to speak. But yeah, the, the silent observer is, is more what Steiner's talking about. Anyway, that, that's the, 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 the gist of my, my first bit of feedback. The second point I already named, I talked about the concept in Hahnemann's medicine of Erzeugungskraft, uh, the generative power, and what to even, how to even begin with that. The, um, why I want to talk about this in this in the context of this chapter is I think uh, like I, I'm I'm thinking of the part of Steiner's chapter here where he's talking about the you know the the human being you know, as we're living our life and collecting experiences and all of this we're kind of gathering all of this into our our inner being or our spiritual being I forget his exact terminology all throughout his chapter here but and he says something to the effect that because of the rigidity of our physical organism, you know, we can't uh, really manifest all of that until the next life, which is kind of pretty interesting, right? It's like, you know, this whole kind of like a, a plant metamorphosis, you know, that's exactly what he's relating it to. 
is we're creating always the seed for the, the next life. So I certainly understand all of that and what, what his point is. But what I wanted to bring up is, I, as I keep mentioning, Hahnemann's Erzeugungskraft, the generative power, is that I think at a, in a number of ways, it is possible for um, the human being. I mean, I think Steiner's model is correct, but I think we get a we get a footnote or we get a, a bypass, so to speak, through Hahnemann's generative power in that we can um, we can soften that rigidity of the organism. We can cure disease. We can you know do all these things therapeutically, which uh, and not even strictly you know in a clinical setting, but which which can give us access to that that reincarnation process within a given life, right? We, we can start to access the capacities we've gathered, which normally would be for the next life, but we can actually bring them forward here now. So anyways, that's um, sort of uh, a few of my, 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 my uh, mental bullet points about you know, my, my two little headings here, but that's uh, sort of some of my big uh, reactions to Steiner reading this chapter. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, all uh, great points. I'll I'll, I'll circle back uh, in a minute. I want to hear from Angus first, though. Yeah, and there are so many uh, good points being made today. It's difficult to um, know where to start. I'm going to. Um, <clears throat> there's two points I want to pick up on, um, and. Yeah, this morning I had to like, take the car in for a service and I was uh, listening to it in the car and I was suddenly struck by some of the wording and it was taking me straight to the Kina Upanishad from the Upanishad, it's like the second Up Upanishad in this series and I was thinking what's going on here, why am I like, f f feeling so, like such a resonance with some of the ideas in there which I, I, I know very well. And I dug into it a little bit, and I'm, I'm going to like share the fruits of, of, of that question. Why do I think, why could I almost describe this as like in part a rewriting of the Kina Upanishad? By the way, Kina, the, the word itself, it means by whom or by what. This idea of create, it's like, who is doing this? Who is doing this living? So... First, I'll start with the Steiner text, then I'll go to the Upanishad, and then I've got another pair to, to do. So on page 775 on my PDF, uh, Steiner says, um, several philosophers such as Dilthi Oiken and others direct philosophical investigation towards the self-observation of the soul. But what they observe are those experiences of the soul that form the basis for the self-conscious ego. Thus, they do not penetrate to the sources in which the experience of the soul originate. These sources cannot be found where the soul first observes itself on the level of ordinary consciousness. If the soul is to reach these sources, it must go beyond this ordinary consciousness. It must experience something in itself that ordinary consciousness cannot give it. And I'm just going to read the first X lines of the Kina Upanishad and see if um, see if you'll still hear the same thing as I do. So it says uh, the Kina Upanishad: Who sends the mind to wander afar? Who first drives life to start on its journey? Who impels us to utter these words? Who is the spirit behind the eye and the ear? It is the ear of the ear, the eye of the eye and the word of words, the mind of mind, and the life of life. Those who follow wisdom pass beyond and on leaving this world become immortal. And in those, it goes on in this vein, it's divided up into four, four parts, but in this imagery that you're using the Kino Upanishads, it's directing us to this type of activity that Steiner's directing to us. It's like, non-sensory uh, or sense-free thinking what is what is the eye of the eye it's leading you to beyond the senses and I, so i find the imagery is like very uh very rich here second point um uh, and in that sense, useful for meditation if people or contemplation if people are into like that 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 route 
The other bit is touching on a topic that's already come up several times here. So like um, uh, this this being that's that's leading us here. Uh, Jeff and John have, and I have like talked about this being of anthroposophy, which Steiner mentions on a handful of occasion as being a a spiritual being, which philosophy is the incarnation of her of this of this being. And this relates to um, later on in this chapter where Stein says, it's like <laughs> explicitly, um, on this basis, it strives to gain access to a world that opens up to a sense-free observation acquired by inner work. One of the teachers of this world conception is the history of philosophy, the being of Sophia, philosophia, anthroposophia itself. It shows that the course of the it shows that the course of philosophical thought tends towards a conception that cannot be acquired in a state of ordinary consciousness. And in um, there's a lot more to this Kino Upanishad than I'm mentioning here, so I'm going to go straight to part four. So Stein here is talking about a being of philosophy, um, similar to Boethius or like Lady Philosophy, um, Philosophia in uh, Dante's Nuova Vita and, and other experiences like this. And we've had this, we've had this passage in the Kino Upanishad where the gods are trying to find out who is this godhead, who is Brahman, and, and, and they don't know. <laughs> um, and uh, they, they there comes a point when they actually are taught who this being who this godhead is and this is the passage that uh, that describes it who is this being then the god spoke to indra the god of thunder o giver of earthly goods go and see what is it that fills us with wonder and indra ran towards brahman the su spirit supreme but he disappeared then, in the same region of the sky, the gods saw a lady of radiant beauty. She was Uma, divine wisdom, the daughter of the mountains of snow. Who is that being that fills us with wonder? He asked. He is Bra This is her answer going into part four. He is Brahman, the spirit, the spirit supreme, she answered. Rejoice in him, since through him you attained the glory of victory. Um, I, I just wanted to share that with the group uh, because we're using very different imagery, very different words, but it's the same for me, essential truth that's being communicated. We've got to go beyond sensory based thinking. Um, Stein isn't unique uh, in what he's saying. He's repackaging it for a modern mind because we now have individual consciousness. It's like a strengthened uh, self-consciousness that wasn't uh, that wasn't with humanity when these when these books were written. Um, but I still think it's very interesting seeing it from this perspective as well as a as complementary reading to what we're doing. So, thank you for listening. <clears throat> Thanks, Angus. It's interesting you were drawn to. Uh or you felt this resonance uh, to this part of the Upanishads because um, when Steiner started talking, talking about reincarnation at the end and the, the way in which the um, awakened soul begins to will its own fate, I thought immediately of the Bhagavad Gita and Arjuna's conversation with Krishna, um, sort of initially resisting entering into the war and having need of uh krishna's enlightenment that uh that it's like the soul who imagines that it is just the slayer or just the slain basically is is living in an illusion and um the truth is it doesn't slay or it, it, it is not uh the slayer or the slain and there's this higher recognition of the um the the karma that has been inherited and the way in which freedom is actually not different from fate it's uh recognizing that you were the doer of the deeds that have now created your fate in this life and so um 
you in a way can identify with your fate as your in a, in a loving way as an expression of your freedom um but let me i want to just back up and make a few comments about the chapter as a whole um because he really does touch back on uh so many of the prior chapters where it seemed like he was making these asides um they didn't fully uh didn't have enough context for us to fully grasp where he was going until his final chapter. Um, the analogy of the seed and the plant and, and this statement he makes that the spiritual scientific researcher is akin to a kind of botanist uh, observing the development of the, of the human soul um, was quite beautiful. And uh, talking about the difference between, and he's talked about this in earlier chapters, but the difference between eating the seed versus planting it in the soil so that it can produce more seeds in the future um, where he says towards the end of the chapter that it is far more important that the philosophical result sorry it is far more important than the philosophical result um, in other words the knowledge seeds that we can eat now it's far more important than this uh, that we develop the forces of the soul in the course of our philosophical work that can be used as soil in preparation for the next life right um and then just a few points about uh early in the chapter he says that um you know natural science was essential for the development of self-consciousness and that there was a more or less um, Kantian approach to natural science resting on the certainty that comes from our self-consciousness. Um, and so Kant is the starting point for this modern natural scientific orientation. And it, it reminded me of something Kant says in the preface to the critique of pure reason where he says that human reason is burdened it's the first two sentences human reason um paraphrasing is burdened by questions that are prescribed by its own nature uh and so it cannot ignore them but nonetheless it also cannot answer them in kant's view because it lacks super sensible perception or body free thinking um and so that the Kant at least recognized that we we can't put these deeper questions about, as he framed it, the immortality of the soul, uh, the origin of the world, um, the existence of God, and so on. We can't put these questions to the side. We are driven by our very nature to inquire into them. And yet, at least in Kant's view, uh, we are um, constitutively incapable of answering the questions that are nature raises so um it really sucks to be a kantian huh <laughs> to be in that type of situation uh but that's the struggle that um modern philosophers and scientists are are going through and, and steiner's trying to direct uh our way into and through this dilemma and then just one more point where um you know i'm um you know jeff you're you're sort of uh sharing insights from how uh you know your own having been steeped in the work of reich and and uh you know sharing um connections to that work and of course for me um whitehead is the the thinker uh that really taught me how to think and i'm coming to steiner with that uh orientation and i couldn't help but think of um a comment Whitehead makes about the task of philosophy, where you know Steiner's talking about the task of philosophy being to recognize the sense world, um, yes, as illusory, but uh, that are through a process of cognition, participatory cognition, reintegrating our own um, human cognitive activity with that which is truly behind the sense world, we can bring this this world then to a, uh, its, its, its truth and its completion. It reminded me of something Whitehead says early on in Process and Reality, 
that uh, I quote him, philosophy is the self-correction by consciousness of its own initial excess of subjectivity in order to recover the totality that has been obscured by the selection uh, that is due to subjectivity. And here for Whitehead, you know, when he says subjectivity, uh, you can think of all the ways that our bodily perceptions, our sense-based way of, of engaging with an external world is, is rooted in a, an evolutionary process where in a biological sense, we've become increasingly specialized and um, attend to those aspects of our experience of the external world that serve uh, survival of, of a physical body. And that philosophy is trying to um, correct this initial excess of uh, subjective obscuration due to this um, specialization, you could say, of our sensory apparatus to return to a sense of uh, consciousness that could grasp uh, the whole again. Um, and so I, I, I was pleased to see this, um, this resonance between, between Steiner uh, and Whitehead. And then the, the last thing I'll, I'll mention here is just, a, and, and Chad actually brought this up in an email to me after the last session, all of this talk of spiritual practice as an attempt to achieve a form of body-free or sense-free thinking can be a bit um, shocking to contemporary ears for those who are pursuing a spiritual path, because I think we're generally used to spirituality being about, um, yeah, critiquing this Cartesian alienated abstract mode of thinking, which Steiner is doing as well. But then contemporary spirituality is often counseling us to get more in touch with our feelings and our emotions and our, our embodiment and to, you know, heal the dualism between mind and body by just diving into uh, the somatic, the, the depths of, of our somatic experience. And so if you're used to, to that approach to correcting the Cartesian, you know, alienation of, of modern thought, hearing Steiner say, no, we need to go deeper into thinking actually can seem a bit, um, if not confusing, then um, yeah, challenging <laughs> because it, it does go against the grain of so much of what it's of what gets called spirituality nowadays. Um, this is definitely true in the kind of, you know, California new age culture in which I am steeped and CIS is steeped. Uh, and so it's, um, it's the, the path that Steiner is, is prescribing is quite different from that. And so I just wanted to note that. And, uh, you know, maybe some of you in reading this for the first time, uh, experience something similar. Um, and I'm grateful that you brought that up, Chad. <clears throat> Perhaps we can we can talk through that more. All right, I'll pause there and uh, invite David to chime in. I, David, you're muted. Thanks. Uh, it seems after we've constructed all these concepts and uh, kind of spliced everything apart so we can analyze it and put it into logical frameworks, it's absolutely necessary to bring it all back together. Like whether it's philosophy, art, music, poetry, science, whatever, like everything, engineering, everything. And that kind of goes back into the notion of like the noun being some sort of abstraction. That's like a static representation of a dynamic process. And the eternal dynamic process is the thing we're aware of constantly. But then from it, we abstract these like essential objects, which we then put a logic on and it helps us in like building bridges. And, but it seems like absolutely essential to return back to that baseline of like dissolving them back into the, whatever it comes out of. Uh, and like the no thing I was saying earlier, I guess it doesn't really matter. I was kind of harping on volley and, and other places about like the soul, the soul, the soul, it's not a real thing, the soul, whatever. But I guess it doesn't really matter because in the end he's saying the same thing. So it doesn't matter what language someone uses, everyone's kind of it's kind of going back to the same thing. So in the microcosm within the macrocosm, call it a soul, whatever, it doesn't make a difference. Like, anyways, that's all. Yeah, thanks, David. There's just a brief little note at the end of the chapter, he talks about Brentano again and the way in which um, 
he brings Hume and Brentano into dialogue. And he basically, Steiner says, um, well, I, I heard him saying it was really a quote from Brentano, but he's taking away from it that it doesn't matter if the soul isn't a substance as we conceive of substance, that there can still be a soul activity as you're putting it that could reincarnate. We don't need to conceive of that as a Cartesian substance, if you want. Um, he quotes Brentano making this point and then he builds on it. And so I'm not exactly sure if Steiner was agreeing um, that, you know, in Hume's uh, cri criticisms of the concept of substance um, in his attempt to observe his own uh, inner soul processes, um, that this led Hume to say that there's no possibility of immortality. But anyways, it just seems to me that we don't need to conceive of the soul as a substance in order to take Steiner's view of reincarnation seriously. We can conceive of it as a process or a verb if, if you want. Uh, Jeff, you're up. Um, my, my soul is a jumble <laughs> at the moment of questions. And, uh, um, one thing that, uh, impression, uh, an impression from this chapter is the, um, the way in which there's a uniformity of evolution that has occurred on a subjective level. I, it's, it's, um, really quite astounding. And it seems, um, accurate to suggest that, that it's a global planetary evolutionary process that indeed that involves individual personal experiences as growingly independent so much so that the the predominant worldview came um together at the same time as natural science and there's a mystery in there to me about what the what the <laughs> um what is is the process there for uh, uh, that is so collectively true, so collect collectively factual that that evolution has been an also an involution at the same time, and that is available for us all in a simultaneity, say, um, of of that evolutionary process. So there's that. Um, um, and then <clears throat> okay, I'll just leave that there because that's a that's a question I have um as relate to what what is this agency? I think Angus was getting at it from a anthroposophia standpoint, but um but there seems to be um um a uh, okay, so the other question is and then it might be related is um he explain he describes the way in which <clears throat> through perception and into our soul life, there's a sort of um, abstracting away from the reality that it is that we're perceiving, and that uh, that is a necessary process to um, to um, uh, a sort of antipathetical process in the soul that's necessary for actually um, transcending the the partial reality that perception brings. So we suppress the thing that would give us full reality in order to achieve a, an independence in the soul to then reachieve the um, the thing that would have given us the, the the reality in the in the first place. And so I think that those two things are related somehow, but I can't quite get my um, my mind around it. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Lorenzo, I think your hand is next. Yep. Uh, my 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 doubt, my question is very very close to to Jeff's because uh, uh, Steiner tells us that uh, we are uh, seen with the usual normal consciousness reality as it is as it were uh, complete closed and we do not realize that it still lacks our active creative um, engagement to actually become whole but he also says that uh, our normal consciousness takes something away from reality and so um, I was 
thinking about this vaguely maybe paradoxical uh, point which is uh is the thing that we take out of reality the same thing and then we ourselves add back to it are we really uh free in creating or our creative part is just discovering what is already there and also how can we take in something out of reality then see it as more closed than uh, it would be uh, if uh, we weren't doing that so it's like what we are taking away out of reality is a degree of freedom and uh, this relates back to the fact what are we to, to build is something new is our creation does it correspond to what was already there that was taken away and so maybe the fact that it is it is a degree of freedom it uh synthesizes these two aspects uh I don't know if I've been clear uh, sort of <laughs> can I add a little addition to that um please uh um the uh Matt mentioned that uh the, the we're sort of at uh, the, in this abstracting process um um uh we're we're trying to enter into a a pure uh body free thinking and relationship to um current spirituality and sp spiritism and and these sorts of things um the irony is that we that that is the process of embodying because what we think of as is, is the body is illusory Whereas what is being created as the body and the soul, and I would argue with David, and we have quite a bit, uh, that the soul is real. It's a it's a real phenomenological activity or process or verb. I don't really care what you want to call it, but it's it has its own virtuating reality, its own independence, and it is a um, major player in in the way in which we incarnate into or we evolve or involute, however you want to describe that, um, and that we are that that um future clairvoyance is actually an entry into the biological processes that we aren't yet there to do that's the one thing he says there right is that the body right now is too rigid to fully be imbued by this creative process and maybe that's the connective tissue between the two things i was asking about as well I'll just insert here briefly and then and then John, you're next. Uh that some post-structuralist thinkers, uh Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, uh have this phrase, um, the body without organs. And they they borrow that from another thinker. Uh maybe one of you will know who it is. Lorenzo's about to type it. Who Antonin Artaud? Artaud, yeah, that's right. And it's it's uh, you know, they're still not. Deleuze and Guattari are not quite doing spiritual science, but they're at least developing what I would call etheric thinking. And this 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 phrase "body without organs" is a an experience of a form of body free thinking. Because what they mean by that is a the body without organs would be a body without uh, the 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 fixed physiological um, forms that that uh, would rigidify our 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 thinking. Uh, so to think with the, the the body without organs, it's another way of thinking about, it, it might be a term for soul, body without organs, that uh, that David might be able to connect with more, just given the baggage that comes along with the word soul. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari, if you've, if you've looked at their work, might give you a way into what Steiner is up to that's, that's not as um, weighed down maybe by traditional terms that carry baggage. So I just wanted to throw that into the mix uh david or sorry uh john you're next and then chad thank you so much is going on in this conversation i can barely keep track of it all um some of the writers that i'm most interested in as interesting as as hegel and schopenhauer and wagner and all of them are i'm interested in people who are alive right now like eben alexander a brain surgeon who got meningitis, went into a coma. His brain turned into a bag of pus, okay? About a few weeks later, 
He came out of the coma. No one expected him to survive. And he had a report that was of great interest to a lot of people because his brain was not functioning, but he had very rich experiences of, a, of an alternate reality. And he reported this with a very scientific mind. He had a, uh, but it was a, 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 mind, a scientific mind that had gone through uh, a, a threshold experience and had returned. So he uh, is able, I believe, to create a different kind of science. He could probably uh, focus a lot of professionals' attention uh, to his experience because he had the x-rays. This was my brain during the coma, and here I am now talking to you today. So he's one person I would give attention to. Jürgen Zweiki, he's a German guy. He wrote uh, Multidimensional Man, This is Affinity. He's had about 60 years of out-of-body experiences, and he's an extremely good reporter. Um, Scott Elliott Hicks, we've mentioned him before. He's written a book recently on Herschel and Steiner, which I'm trying to get through. Um, Graham Nichols, Navigating Out-of-Body. Robert Monroe is deceased, but he wrote three pivotal books, Journeys Out-of-Body series. Um, Reich has already been mentioned here. Um, I would... Uh, and they're, they're, those, are the, those are just some of the people that I think are, are very useful for uh, contrasting and comparing what Steiner was uh, trying to put forward in his particular time and place. And I also think that we have to remember that there are activists, there are, there are practitioners, there are intellectuals. Some people excel in one or the other. Some people excel in all of them. I happen to think that Steiner was talking from intellect to intellect to an intellectual culture, which was in, in incredible decline. And I think it's declining even further since his, since his uh, passing. But I think he also uh, had a space for practice. He had a space for activism. And he kept, I think of him as like one of those Chinese acrobats with all the spinning wheels on the, and he keeps turning, turning this one, turning this one, turning this one. Um, so um, that's why I think he's interesting to read right now. But I think that many many others have carried forward, uh, through, sometimes through trauma, some of um, some some very illuminating experience. And just to add something to this, when I think also to talk about the duality, duality is built into into the body. Most of the, the body wants to be invisible. It wants to hide. And that's why we can function. Because if I knew what was going on in my pancreas and I knew what was going on in my liver and I was not, no, I'm not now I would be a total mess and would not be able to function in a, a reliable way and an environment such as the one we're in, which is in constant flux. So there are very good reasons why this duality is built into us. But once we, that duality has broken down through either trauma, through, through meditation, through hypnosis, through altered states, through athletics, through art, whatever. Once that's broken down and we see outside through our eyes, and then we're aware that there's something behind us that's very fluid and isn't structured in the same way as what is out there visually in front of us, then we have a different relationship to our embodiment. And I believe these kinds of experiences, however they come about, uh, whether they're planned for and uh, methodically, uh, you know, certain practices like Vajrayana or certain kinds of yoga or whatever, um, that they can be, uh, th these uh, kind of uh, experiences can be activated. But I think it's very important that we have a community of competence, that we can hold the tension um, that uh, happens when this new kind of embodiment starts to emerge. And I think that's probably a calling that many of us feel. And that's why we're joining these calls and trying to articulate better than we have before um, some of these tensions and stresses that uh, you know our world is, is now in, in, I think, very advanced stages of collapse. Yet, I'm also extremely optimistic. Some of the things that are coming through are just absolutely mind-boggling. So, also a Philip, 
Philip Moffat, a Buddhist teacher, has written a book called The Nine Bodies, very, another very interesting book. But, but all of the ones I mentioned are basically working with the subtle, working with the subtle realms. And um, this, I don't think could be, sh you're not gonna find this in many academic programs unless you're with, with Ashton and, and Matt. I think they have a, probably a, a, a wonderful uh, a curriculum that they're, they're creating there. So those are some of my uh, thought feels about this. And I could say a whole lot more and I'm sure all, we, all of us can, but I'm very mindful of our time and just want to express my gratitude once again that we all got together and made this happen. And I'm really looking forward to the next wave as we go into, um, what is it, the pulse of freedom? Or that's- uh, Philosophy of- Philosophy freedom. of freedom. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, John. Um, Chad, you're up at one point about the Eben Alexander and near-death experiences generally and out-of-body experiences as uh, a body of of evidence. And it's, you know, people's um, first person reports because none of us went with them on this journey through the threshold beyond death. But these people come back with these experiences and often they were declared brain dead or um, gained information that they wouldn't have been able to based on where their body was in a hospital bed uh, of other places in the hospital or what have you. And I think that's a body of evidence that we should take seriously. I've liked to play with, you know, OBE is the acronym usually for out of body experience. It could also be other body experience though. And I think um, that might provide more of an anchor for those who come to the, that sort of uh, evidence with some skepticism. Uh, and, you know, Steiner provides a very uh, detailed description of what these other bodies might be uh, and what they're capable of. And so rather than just thinking of it as body free, we can talk about other bodies, right? And, and when we're body free, could we also be ego free? That doesn't mean we're ego less or mm. body less. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we move. Can the crucifixion become an acupuncture treatment? I believe <laughs> it can. And once it becomes an acupuncture treatment, then what happens to the resurrection? Hmm. And then I think we could, but I don't think we have to wait for our next incarnation. Hmm. I think we can speed it up really fast and we may not have to reincarnate since we're, many of us are reincarnated. In my lifetime, I've reincarnated so many <laughs> times going from you know baby to toddler, to adult, to adolescent. And all of us have, we've all gone through incredible mind-boggling thresholds. So I, I think that um, this resur resurrection be a different kind of resurrection. And I, I think that that process may not stop. Mm. Interesting, a lot to say there, but I wanna give Chad a chance to chime in here. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Um, thanks everyone for such a rich discussion. And um, yeah, it's been wonderful to follow along. And what you're describing there, John, is the, the death rebirth experience um, that we do have at many times in life. And what um, Stan Groff's research is, is focused on with psychedelic journeys is the death rebirth experience and the, uh, the numinous, you know, you can just basically say the archetypal realm that we're encountering when we are in um, an out-of-body experience or in non-ordinary thinking, not normal consciousness. Um, but... And also just to point to your, your, your point about trauma and um, like Carl Jung's um, descent into uh, a four year kind of um, what would be called a psychosis, but was where he actually encountered the archetypes and was able to identify them and, and their autonomy was the source of his um, life's work ultimately. And I think we can go back to, you know, this began in ancient Greece where it is, you know, more than likely that both Socrates and, and all, many, if not all of the philosophers there <clears throat> went to the Oracle of Delphi and most likely had um, a psychedelic journey, probably potentially more powerful than any psychedelic we have today even. Um, and that Plato and Socrates insights actually originated from those experiences. Um, so, but then I think we can also recognize that what's happening in the evolution of consciousness is the differentiation of the individual collectively, like humanity is moving from 
the picture consciousness of like a unitive, like, you know, hunter gatherer state where we saw ourselves as a collective, not as individuals in the sense that we see ourselves now and that there's been a, an indwelling of a buffering self as Charles Taylor describes the buffering of the ego. And that is what Steiner's referring to in that we, you know, we, we had to, you know, do that in order to create the ego of individual percept and conceptual understanding of ourselves as individuals, but that we, you know, um, and that's where Kant gets stuck is that like trapped within that buffered self that <clears throat> in the sense that he felt like we couldn't contact the transcendent world with any actual genuine authentic um, relationship. And that's where I was, I was concerned in my questions to Matt that, that, that Steiner was repeating that error in the sense of the body free consciousness or, you know, that like it wasn't connected in some way to the phenomenal world that, but, but the more I read here in this last chapter, it, it does seem as though he is a little ambiguous, but at times he's also saying that the insights that come in the meditative state of body free um, thought needs to be coherent with our sensory experience ultimately. Um, and that's kind of coming back to the body and having it be recognized with some validity or truth of our, of our waking day consciousness experience. But then I think in, in the way that you, several of you are describing um, this need to balance and bring back the two different perspectives, I think we can understand rather clearly through Ian McGilchrist's work with hemispherectomy, like the, the brain hemispheres and the way they cognize the world in different ways. And this paragraph um, specifically in this last chapter of Steiner, I'll read it, uh, speaks exactly to this. He says, our mental organization tears the reality apart into two factors. The one factor presents itself as perception, the other as intuition, the other to intuition. Only the union of the two, that is the percept fitting systematically into the universe constitutes the full reality. If we take mere percepts by themselves, we have no reality, but rather disconnected chaos. If we take by itself the law and order connecting the percepts, then we have nothing but abstract concepts. Reality is not contained in the abstract concept. It is, however, contained in thoughtful observation, which does not one-sidedly consider either concept or percept alone, but rather the union of the two. And that's exactly the case. The, the left hemisphere is abstracting phenomena. Um, it's, it's, it's isolating the seed against the background of gravel in order to grasp it, in order to eat it. But what's we're doing that with ideas as well we're abstracting concepts and we're t we're ripping it apart from the the actual context of, of the whole but it's the right hemisphere that has intuition and the imagination and the capacity to intuitively know the world um and but we have to bring back both in order for a new full a full understanding of reality to to be realized um so and then the last thing i'll kind of tie this up with is um because my understanding comes from Richard Tarnas's work primarily in as through the archetypal astrological perspective. And, you know, um, in that understanding, it's both, you know, I think the meditative and I, I and I want to like, I'm, I want to re-champion <clears throat> what Steiner is saying and the super sensible, like that is the psychedelic experience and you are, going into super sensible realms and connecting to the imagination and connecting to the archetypal realm. And, but that realm is not actually separate from the body. Um, you can experience archetypes visually, very sensorially. They can possess you. Mars is a, li a literal, uh, a God that possesses people to violence. Um, it takes people's consciousness over and acts, um, but we're always in relationship to them. And what the astrological perspective provides is the capacity to see ourselves more holistically as connected to the cosmos. Um, the archetypal dynamics in your birth chart are like where the planets are in the sky when you were born. 
reflect your psyche. They reflect how you think. Um, I could show you Steiner's birth chart. He has Mercury, the mind, the way you think and cognize the world, and in a conjunction with Neptune, which is the imagination, the super sensible, the archetypal realm. And it's why he was clairvoyant in many ways. Um, but it's interesting in this conversation, I hadn't quite recognized this. He's He has sun opposite Saturn. And that's the rigidity of the body that he experiences. And you, and you see in his pictures, he's just, he's standing up straight. It's like, it's all, you know, very rigid, but it's square to Uranus and Uranus is freedom, the revolutionary insight, the new paradigm. Um, so he's doing both of those things and connected to the archetypal realm. And the other thing I just, I looked up this week was um, when he wrote truth and science and the philosophy of freedom, there was a Pluto-Neptune conjunction in the sky. This only happens every 500 years. Um, and there was a Pluto-Neptune-Uranus triple conjunction at the axial period in from 600 BC to 500 BC. It's the only time when the three outer planets that we weren't aware of were in the same place in the sky. And the Buddha was born, Thales, it's the beginning of uh, philosophy. It's also when the Hebrew Bible was redacted. Um, Lao Tzu and Confucius were born at the same time. Um, and that Pluto-Neptune conjunction in Steiner's chart was conjoining his Uranus. So he had the three outer planets that are connected to the axial age and the capacity to you know, reveal Uranus, Neptune, the, the spiritual vision. And Pluto is the evolutionary transformational depth that happened in the axial period. And also we can see potentially happening in Steiner's work. Um, so my ultimate point here is that it's a co-creative process with the physical world. The planets are very physical, yet they point to and connect to the archetypes. They both are true, um, but we can't eliminate the body. That's the other thing in, in McGilchrist's work is the right hemisphere is connected to the body. The left hemisphere in, in um, split brain patients and people who have uh, strokes can deny the body completely that the body even is doing certain things that it's clear that it's doing it can deny it to a, a radical extent um so yeah i think it's a combination of all of these things um but i just wanted to um reaffirm that archetypal perception is both a super sensory process but it's also not completely separate from the body completely and it has to come back and unify to both right and left hemisphere so that's those are my two cents mm. i love that chad a lot of helpful insights there i know we're running over a little bit but i don't think we can help it uh Sorry. this time um in terms of the body it it strikes me that you know with mcgillchrist's uh hemisphere hypothesis that yeah the right hemisphere is more in tune uh with the somatic processes, but that ultimately the body that we perceive with our sense organs as limited by the skin is in fact, in truth, the whole of the, the world, right? The, the, the whole world is our body, right? And the right hemisphere as McGilchrist depicts it, perceive into it that directly, right? So it's, it's not the um, skin encapsulated uh egoic perception of the body it's ego in the you know we it, steiner doesn't mean ego in the way that most uh contemporary spiritual practitioners mean ego but there's a there's a body bound ego which is the uh the let's say um the small self that we identify with before we've you know had a, a deeper uh spiritual experience of the soul um, that might be limited to, to the skin of, of this physical body, but yeah, the real body is the whole world. Um, we got lots of hands up. I think uh, Jeff, yours is first and John, I'm not sure if yours is still up, but yeah, go ahead, Jeff, you first. Um, it's a very powerful um, imperative almost, I think in this chapter, if he would have known say where medical science went, from this perspective. So if we're talking about a super sensible consciousness that is then 
um, participating in the in the bringing about of of health right down into the physiology. And we live in a world where um, medical science has been instrumentalized to such a degree that um, we are capturing our knowledge in silico, for example. And um, um, the what you can see here is the seeds for a science of economics because he talks about the trans we come to the world and we transform natural resources into something right in this case it's our soul or it's uh it's a psycho spiritual experience but we have a um inherent relationship with transforming that which we come to terms with i don't think there's a, another creature on earth that has that transformative both negative, positive, good, bad, and different. It's just a, it's just a fact. There's uh, what is, what does sociology mean uh, as a science in light of um, understanding the ways in which we um, uh, are repelling away from reality and gaining a self-conscious ego that brings reality back to us in a, in a, in a social construction standpoint. And uh, and so a science of sociology uh, is in seed form here, of course, as I've mentioned before, not taken up. And, and, and also in seed form here is a, is a science of, of psychology uh, that is ob, um, observing of the laws of the psyche through uh, a, uh, that which generates the, the forms in the psyche. Um, it seems like uh, wildly imperative in our time when we're threatening our own existence to that this this is a science to be taken up not in an airy fairy spiritual scientific sense meaning that it's enclosed within spiritual experience but that it's it's actually offering us that which is uh, uh knowable right down into the to the physiology of the body and um I, I could go on for an hour as relates to what ashton brought it was just uh i mean what um Ch chad brought uh it's beautiful so philosophy of freedom here we come yeah thanks jeff i was just gonna say i was typing in the in the chat that philosophy of freedom could be read as a radical uh social political manifesto though unlike most such manifestos it's directed to the individual because to bring about the type of um truly free society that we would like to see you've got to start each individual with each individual uh rather than imposing some kind of social program from on high um so it's it's i've seen others read it who have no idea about the spiritual science um underlying it or that was articulated by steiner after it uh they viewed it as a kind of anarchist cookbook as it were <laughs> for a kind of anarchist society um not realizing just how deep the um spiritual roots of it in fact go um john did well, you have your I, hand up again oh, go ahead uh, just very briefly i really appreciate everything that's been added but uh i'm just thinking of metaphors and i think that's where our freedom is uh as contemporary scholars activists practitioners is we can generate metaphors um some of the metaphors in the text that pop out are the seed the seed that is eaten the seed that is planted um the the mirror um the body as mirror. I'm thinking of the body as window, as an Eckhart. My eye is a window, the eye through which I see God is the same eye through which God sees me. I'm thinking someone mentioned Artaud, the theater in its double, the, and the Artaud said, we are like martyrs signaling through the flames. <laughs> so also St. Thomas, the gospel, I think that uh, moves me the most is that Jesus said, if you bring forth that which is within you, it will save you. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, it will destroy you. So all of these are kind of right brain con you know, configurations working with left brain. So I think that's great about your interview that you did um, with the, the that uh, Ian McGilchrist, and that's been mentioned here too. I think that what's great is the right brain, the left brain create a rhythm. And that rhythm is the third, and it's invisible, but it is what keeps uh, keeps the uh, the harmonization if it's possible. But it's also a built-in asymmetry. 
there's always going to be something that every metaphor that we come up with, every narrative that we come up for, every theory that we come up for, will uh, reveal and it will also conceal. So I'm just sharing that uh, summary statement here. Thanks once again. I really enjoyed this very much. Yeah, thanks, John. And just a reflection on you know the hemisphere hypothesis and the the relationship between the brain and consciousness. I think we can still, uh, you know, from an anthroposophical perspective, take McGilchrist's research seriously, remembering that as our neuroscientific understanding develops, what we're really doing is polishing the mirror of the body and seeing how um, our self consciousness is reflected in and by the physiology of the brain, even if it, and McGilchrist agrees, is not produced inside the brain or by the brain, right? So it, it's neuroanatomy functions as a mirror so that we can better understand ourselves and become more self-conscious, right? I think that's how I would frame it. And then also the way Chad uh, brought up psychedelic experience, um, it strikes me that there's there's certainly some, and some anthroposophists, contemporary anthroposophists have written about this, the danger of getting lost in the kind of astral realm as a result of experimenting with psychedelics so they can produce an experience or a state of consciousness that can't really be achieved as a stage of one's own development. Um, but I do think that psychedelics can function for people today uh, in revealing this state of consciousness that is free of the body and that reveals the way in which the sense world is not the full extent of reality, that there are other domains and other realities, other dimensions of the universe is hard to deny if you've if you've had some you know particularly intense psychedelic experiences. So it's at least a way of uh making clear to the ordinary materialistic consciousness of our day that um that the percept the perception of the world uh as as if the sense perceptible world was uh had its had its reality intrinsic to itself that gets blown open and you see that there are deeper layers to reality then the question is how do you cultivate uh that form of higher consciousness as a as a stage of your own development and i don't think psychedelics can do that for you right just wanted to throw that into the mix. Um, Angus, did you put your hand down or did you want to chime in and then David and then we should... Uh, I, I, I'd like to like close out if it's okay with everybody with a couple more lines from this. Sure. But, and I think you'll, you'll see perhaps one way of summarizing what we've been doing. <laughs> okay. Let's, do you want to hold for a sec if you want to close this out? I think that'd be great and see if David wants to chime in first and then we'll... Come back to you, Angus. Yeah. Uh, so the thing you said about psychedelics can only take you so far. I think uh, it can definitely show you that, like what we have, well, this is my interpretation, the reality as it is, is a software we've developed over thousands of years to help in reproducing and gathering resources. And if we never perturb that software, we think that is, I'm using like a programming metaphor because when we're, it's, if we never perturb that, we think that's what it, like the baseline is of everything but then there's some sort of other mechanism that's generating that. And it's almost crazy. I don't know about others, but it's almost crazy how like technological it can be. Like, it, I don't know if that's just a quality of me was, I was like looking into programming a lot when I was doing it. So maybe it was like linked, uh, but it's crazy how technological it can be like weird geometries with syntax into them. And if I try to make an effort, I can actually like read, there's some sort of almost like a logo or something in it. I'm like, what the hell is all that about? But, uh, what I was going to say before I went on that tangent is the, um, the notion, if we all exist as memories in a sense, and we have this notion of being encapsulated as selves with our own state and we're all separate, uh, it makes it difficult, but maybe we're all one. And this is a thing that has been said many times by many people, but like we're all one mind that is manifesting in different ways and concressing in different ways as part of this one wave of concrescence. And it must, it might be easier to just, in a way, remove all those barriers and try to see if there's, I mean, people call it archetypal, but then I think I'm not aware of how to explore the archetypes in a way that I would be satisfied with what I find. But even someone like Grotendieck wrote about, uh, I think archetypes, but I don't know much about it. So I'm open to it, but 
I think if we remove the barriers, then it might be easier to grasp it all. And if we put the barriers back up, then we're looking in a logic that we're constructing and those are always going to be limited. So, yeah. Yeah, David, I think I've often thought of humanity as the Anthropos, as one being ultimately, but during this phase of our evolution, we have individuated because there's something that can only be learned uh, by individuals. And that includes reincarnating through multiple lifetimes, but that this process of individuated consciousness in the form of unique human beings will eventually come to an end, revealing that we are actually one anthropos one one human being right that needed to experience itself multiplied uh, is there a teleology is there an end or is there just like do you think we just create then and we have a degree of freedom or do you think there is a fixed end for the species or uh i don't know how fixed but there's a there's a telos for sure there's a there's a there's a lure drawing us forward yeah i mean big big questions but let's let's we have to draw this session to an end and um angus is going to help us with that and then uh ashton and i want to just say a few things about philosophy of freedom go ahead angus okay this is this is still actually from part one of the kina upanishad um what cannot be spoken with words but that whereby words are spoken know that alone to be brahman the spirit and not what people here adore what cannot be thought with the mind but that whereby the mind can think know that alone to be brahman the spirit and not what people here adore what cannot be seen with the eye but that whereby the eye can see know that alone to be brahman the spirit and not what people here adore what cannot be heard with the ear but that whereby the ear can hear. Know that alone to be Brahman, the spirit, and not what people here adore. What cannot be indrawn with breath, but that whereby breath is indrawn. Know that alone to be Brahman, the spirit, and not what people here adore. And then the final couple of sentences, the master is talking to his disciple, and he says to his disciple, if you think I know well, little truth you know you only perceive that appearance of brahman that lies in the senses and is in you pursue your meditation lovely thanks angus that's perfect um so i'm gonna i'm gonna stop the recording here